can all hear me, even though it's late in the day. I'm so very happy to be here and a little confused because um, we are much earlier in the process of presenting work that I usually do. I was asked to present an ongoing project that I'm working on at the moment, and I'm not quite sure what it's about, <laughs> how it's going to materialize, what is it, it's going to end up like. But in a way, when I got the invitation, I thought it fits the idea of the project perfectly. So, but let's see if you follow me and agree or what you think. I've even brought a manuscript, um, just uh, at least to pretend like I know what I'm saying. Um, for now, this is the project. It's, um, it's a project on Instagram. And maybe I should actually start by introducing myself a little bit more. Um, just for context, I usually call myself a champagne anarchist, which is a, a, a sort of a funny way of saying that I live in a welfare state, but I'm very dissatisfied with it. I am a very far lefty. I really, really want to change the world. And yet I depend on the funds from the state. <laughs> I engage in political parties, I, so on and so on. So I'm enmeshed in a system that I'm not necessarily that happy about. I used to be a graffiti writer. Uh, I used to be a freaker and open up phone boxes on the street to f call for free to my friends in the US. I am always discontent, no matter what everything looks like. And I'm possessed by this DIY ethos of, I think I picked up in the 90s in Danish hip hop when no American records were available and we had to sort of invent it ourselves. We had one record, 10 people, it would circulate. The rest of the time we would rap to each other. Um, and this combined with my early experiences in the pre-internet uh, BBS culture sort of meshes for me to something that seems very cogent, but probably to you seems like a weird combination. So this project is kind of an attempt at bringing those things together. I am using stable diffusion, um, an open, a fairly open source um, <laughs> algorithm to, to imagine a combination of 90s hip hop, DIY ethos, focus on the individual, focus on joy and collective collectivity, and the workers' movement in Denmark. And the, for now, it consists of 44 studies, videos and images that are all available. Uh, on Instagram and then unfold as time passes. Tomorrow I'll probably post something new, the day after something else, as I try to figure out what putting up these parameters and what trying to imagine reimagining the past might be about. Everything comes from this idea that even if we know the images are from AI, even if we know they're false, they affect us, even if let me give you an example. I once recreated my grandmother's nose from the only photo I have of her. And now when I dream of her, her in the middle of her face is this weird lump, this algorithmic recreation of a nose. So the, my real memories were substituted by the image of her nose that I created myself. In this way, how images pass into us, even with all of our criti critical guards and so on, and how <laughs> we are constantly bombarded by fake manipulated images. Um, so, so what to do in this situation where uh, we are meshed in a society that I don't like, using social media that's a horrible shit show, um, and I'm using an algorithm made in the UK so that it it's very difficult to make anything that looks like it happened in Denmark. Um, okay, so I, I, I built my own server. Uh, I download the open source model and I run it on my own so that I can mo modify it. I try to get a little bit of autonomy, even though I can't really understand the math that well. I can sort of read the code, I can manipulate it a little bit. But there's a sort of a, a negotiation. I get a little bit of autonomy by not subscribing to a service that might change its prompts tomorrow. I don't know if any of you have experienced how they're constantly changing the system, so one prompt might work one day and not the next day. Now I have complete control in my basement, as I talked about. Um, okay, so let's, let's look at an example. 
all of these 44 studies are images, series of 10 to 15 pictures or videos combined with a small narrative. This one is about how, um, and they're all fake, they're all lies, but they're all somewhat believable anyway. This is uh, Sun Ra, the famous uh, Afro-American futurist, arriving in Denmark and inspiring the local labor movement. It's... Um, it's a sort of a dream of what if the Danish labor movement hadn't turned inward, hadn't become xenophobic? What if it had instead turned outwards, reached out for inspiration for other from other struggling places and made international ties of solidarity? And the more you look at the images, the more you notice its imperfections. This sort of state of the algorithm now is full of weird stuff at the margins. As, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I had a feeling in a moment the, the stable diffusion or whatever comes next will be much better. We will get realistic images. But at the moment, this kind of lie of the past that I'm creating and the false narratives are obviously fake. You can see it in the images. They all break down. Their authority is temporary and negotiable. I'm creating a minor history, not a major history. I'm creating a version of history, not a definitive authoritative one. And I mean, if you look at what they actually want you to produce, it's dragons, it's tropical beaches, it's beautiful women, it's all of these things that you're meant to produce with it. So the other point for me is to try and take technology that's obviously meant for something and misuse it. I don't think anybody developing stable fusion or any of the other so-called AI uh, systems, thought that somebody would want to reinvent Danish hip-hop in the 90s and the labor movement. And there's a certain satisfaction in taking something that's meant to give you one kind of image and then trying to turn it and twist it and find out how can I, how can I pervert it. The next image is an image of... <coughs> I don't know, let's, in, in the Danish system, in the Danish local discussions, the welfare state is like the primary mythology. Um, um, but it never, if, you, if you ever get ill, the image of the uh, image of the welfare state never really matches the services. There's a big dream projected about how we are all served, and then once you hit the welfare system, as I was sick for several years, and fell through the system. So there's a kind of a myth and a reality that's interesting to play with. So in this kind of idea, I, I thought about, um, what's his name? Friedensreich Hunterwatzer, who's an Austrian artist, who um, said that every, he built some buildings and he allowed everybody to paint around their own windows. So instead of making one total plan for how the, pay, uh, the building should be painted, he allowed everybody to have agency locally. What would a hospital, where it was like that, where the, where the, where the people working there were allowed to paint it, where the people who were ill were allowed to change things, build things, change the hospital, what would a colorful, joyful, <laughs> less mechanical healthcare system look like? And of course, it's also inspired by the Danish artist Paul Gernes, who some of you might be familiar with. Or um, this photo of uh, somebody who looks like uh, Helle Thorning Smith, the first Danish prime, uh, female prime minister, playing a set of records at her inauguration. Imagine what kind of other politicians we might have if they'd come from the DIY hip hop scene instead of the big politi political schools and private schools. Imagine what a joyful politics of collectivity might be like. These are the kind of things I'm, kind of, I'm trying to get at. And there's always this kind of combination of the photo, which is just me describing somebody who looks like Helle Thorning, and then a thousand pictures come up. I pick the ones, as, uh, I mean, like we talked about earlier, through sort of a process of curation, that look the most like Helle Thorning, but they still don't quite look like Helle Thorning. So I write a little narrative. I suspend your disbelief a little bit. So, but once you've read Helle Thorning over here in the description and you see the pictures, they become Helle Thorning. It's a sort of a sl sleight of hand. It's a magical trick by planting the idea that she's there uh, in the image, I make you believe in it. And then you begin to notice all the identical men in the background. Um, and why would you want to do, the, do anything like this? Well, it's because I feel like all discussions of the future have kind of 
been lost to Elon Musk. Like there's a kind of a, a collective uh, dread, a lack of imaginary futures. And I find myself having a difficult time stepping out of those futures. I have a hard time imagining something that's not a vacuum powered super rail or an outer space adventure where we can leave a burning planet behind. I'm having a lot of trouble getting out of those narratives, getting, getting somewhere else. So I turn to the past and I think like e every time we discuss the past, whether it's saying like things were always like this or before this happened, or as you say, algorithms always interpolate the future using data in the past. So they're kind of always telling you everything remains the same. So there's a kind of a, like, how can you do something about it? You need to reinvent the past, right? Um, and I, there's something like in this kind of remix culture of the, the algorithm that's this sort of huge field of potential images that have been collected, fa that ha have been sort of fairly collective, this kind of feeling of infinite potential, that, and, and the, the fact that you're sort of always remixing, it's a little bit like scratching a record and, and like finding the best point in the record as the early DJs did, and then repeating it over and over <laughs> instead of letting it pass on to the next thing. Um, another example is, um, and then I also wanted to talk about how all of these things are both factual and fictional. I mean, they're, they're very fictional, but somewhat factional. For example, um, there's another short story about how hip hop arrived via the West Coast and sailors on the West Coast as a kind of a part of a fisherman's culture, uh, rather than this kind of urbane hip hop myth we have now, right? And that, that it builds on the fact that there actually used to be, for example, between Denmark and, and the south of Sweden, a common language between the fishermen. They used to speak a language. There used to be lots of cultural transport across the borders that we now consider to be very rigid linguistically or whatever. So like, I, I, I thought to myself, OK, if we take that feeling of between the nation states, between the different cultures, there are liminal fields, there are translations, there are things lying between what is American history and what is Danish history? What if we said that there's a room for negotiation? <laughs> what if we don't buy into those national narratives of originality or gene genealogy? What if um, the kind of weird versions of English rap I made because I couldn't speak English, <laughs> you know, where you misunderstand the words and you try anyway, and you listen to things and you misunderstand them completely and you see small photocopies of American graffiti pieces and you think graffiti pieces are supposed to be this big. You go into a little tunnel and you paint them by hand because you don't know about spray paint. All of those ways are actually ways of reconfiguring and re-understanding and also re just, um, maybe refuting cultural global hit homogeny of the big tech of American popular culture and saying, hey, there are minor histories. There's something going on at the margins. Maybe you might actually discover something in Danish hip hop that would be valuable for the majority culture of the global hip hop, the commercialized global hip hop. And along the same lines, there's a story of uh, hip hop uh, blossoming in Jewish which is uh, one of those marginal, so-called marginal areas that are always pointed to in Denmark as underdeveloped, full of racist, all these things. So I turned it on its head and said, this is the most joyful, the most collective, the most hip hop place. They were the ones who drove a more organic, more nature-based hip hop into being. So this kind of tick, and all of those are things that I think about because they're in the newspaper or they're being discussed, that I try to bring into this fictional world and talk about them in the past because in a way that gives me leeway to think about them differently than in the ways I usually do as this sort of lefty person saying, you should all stop eating meat now. So instead I can do this <laughs> and sort of hopefully through the back door make it possible to imagine not just making meat um, illegal, but a joyful, happy life with vegetables. Um, and finally, um, again, the Danish Ministry of State dancing. Uh, and maybe return a little bit to this idea of the joyful and the collective, which I also feel like was a part of the workers' movement originally. If I go back 
So the original collective songs, the building of beautiful buildings for each other, the collective pooling of resources, the sharing of knowledge, the resistance, all those things that I really remember, <laughs> but that somehow seem forgotten now. How can, I, can we reinvigorate those? How can we think of a labor movement that is not about making productive citizens who will produce a better uh, national economy, <laughs> but about creating a, a place in the world, a history maybe? Maybe there was even somebody before who thought about making a joyful collective society where we struggle for equity for all. It doesn't exist. <laughs> I'm not sure it ever will. But I feel like just by imagining the past, it becomes easier for me to imagine a different future than what I'm usually presented with. And I feel like that's something that I learned from the Afrofuturists. That's something that I learned from hip hop. That's something that I learned from the labor movement. And I feel like the depiction of hip hop now, the depiction of the labor movement now have lost those. How can we regain them? How can we write them back into the histories? Not as the major history, but as a minor history. One of hopefully many histories. I'm sure there are other people in this room with similar histories of subcultures or other places they went because they were discontent with the ways things were organized. Maybe they became live role players, pretending that the world was a, that the school was a big spaceship, or maybe. I don't know, maybe they rode horses and dreamt about being closer to nature, who knows? But I think so many people dream <laughs> of other worlds and dream of other pasts and other futures that if we just give them space and maybe uh, like a stupid project like this to reimagine, maybe there's a chance we could still imagine a future that is not defined by techno-optimists or tech monopolies. Um, yeah. There's so many other things to talk about, the cultural bias of the, the algorithms, how <laughs> as a Dane, you can never get anything that looks like Denmark. <laughs> you always get all these weird, uh, slightly there are always mountains in the background. You're like, mm, not very Danish, or the Danish parliament, uh, which I really wanted to include, it's all dark panels and faux gothic like uh, the, the British parliament. All of these traces of things that actually as soon as I say it's in Denmark, they become not a problem, but a way of making obvious that it's a fiction within the fiction. So there's a, this sort of double suspension of disbelief, where you think, oh yeah, that's the prime minister playing records. I don't remember that. And then there's like, but there's also something wrong with the image, right? Because I don't think the point is that we need to create a new authoritative lineage of history. We need to make room for many, many histories. Thank you. <laughs>